Good evening and welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. If you'd stand with us this evening, stand with us and sing number 250, number 250, He Keeps Me Singing. for number 79, hymn number 79, Where the Roses Never Fade. Where the tree of life is blue. 
this evening, God, I want to thank you that we are able to gather here, Lord, with freedom, Lord, without any worry, God. Um, Lord, we thank you for what a, what an amazing place of, of worship and fellowship, Lord, that we get to gather here, God, and be genuine with you, God. Um, Lord, I lift up this time of singing and preaching to you, Lord. I, I ask that you would fill G with the Holy Spirit, God. You've given the words to say, and you've helped him to, to give us a message from the word, God. Lord, I lift up the upcoming events, Lord, uh, as far as the, uh, the back-to-school rally goes, Lord, and there's a lot of preparation yet to be done with that, God. I ask that you would have your hand over it, Lord, and also for the building, you would have your hand over that, God. Um, Lord, I thank you for just the wonderful time that me and all the other teenagers and all the younger uh, young kids had at junior camp, Lord. It was truly a blessing, Lord, and we thank you for those times of blessing that you allow us to take part in, Lord. Um, Lord, we lift up the rest of this service to you, Lord, that it would be pleasing to you, and in your precious name, Jesus Christ, amen. All right, I believe you can remain seated for right now. We're going to do our song picks, and I don't believe there's any stipulations tonight for song picks, right? It's not like an age group. As long as she has them in the book. All right, so we'll, we'll pick three songs tonight, and if she has them, she has them. If she doesn't, you can go out, out back and pound sand. All right. <laughs> Who's uh, anybody? Yes, ma'am. Ancient of Days. Do you have Ancient of Days? That I do. All right. She has Ancient of Days. All three verses. Next. Dane. Ten Thousand Reasons. I have that. Okay. Derek, it is well. What's the number? 275. Wait, our idiot savant back there. He's not good at anything else, but he knows where the hymns are. That's three, right? We have three? Oh. And wait, what were you saying, Larry? Huh? Oh, we have visitors? Yeah, we have visitors. Yes, we'll do four. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Wade, do you have a number for that one? No, he doesn't. 423. So we'll do that in the order that we received them, ancient, 10,000, 275, and then 423. All right, for the next song, we'll sing tonight 213, 213. I believe we're learning this song. Um, we, did we sing it as a chorus the last time we sang it? I don't think we sang the verses, but we'll give the verses a shot. Uh, the timing on the verses are a little bit weird because the spacing between the words is different on every verse, but it begins with the chorus, and then we'll jump into the verse Back to the chorus, verse, chorus end, okay? I'm the 
Amen. If you'll stand with us for this next song, you'll stand number 163. Number 163, only trust him. song that we're going to see is number 16. Number 16, it is no secret.
couple of announcements here. Um, Mrs. Erickson and Missy will be going to the ocean, going to Ocean City tomorrow um, to walk the shops and have lunch. If any lady wants to join them, you can see Missy or Mrs. Erickson after the service. Um, and then we have the back to school rally coming up this Friday at, on September 2nd at 6 o'clock. And Pastor Kenny Baldwin will be uh, preaching that. And if you want to help in, um, with monetary donations, you can mark it on your offering envelope. Or if you want to uh, bring sodas or chips, um, you can do that before Wednesday. That'd be a blessing. And then um, also just to help um, throughout the service, you can um, you know, come a little bit earlier um, just to help set up. Um, Thursday, we're going to be putting up a tent for the back-to-school rally, so if anyone would like to help with that, uh, you can see Justin. Labor Day Sunday is September 4th, and we'll be starting the day under the tent for one of our mor- for the morning service, and then followed by a picnic. Please bring a side dish to share. After the picnic, we'll have a, an afternoon service at 2.30, followed by a softball game. Uh, men's breakfast will be uh, September 10th. It's a Saturday morning at 8 o'clock at the Galloway Diner. And men, feel free to invite your uh, family, friends, or neighbors uh, to that. Soul Winning Blitz uh, later on that day at 1030. We'll be meeting here at the church and going out on the church bus. And um, that's 1030, Saturday, September 10th. Uh, Combined service at Lake Lenape will be September 11th. And that is um, over there at the Fully Loves Lake House. And if you need directions to that, you can see Sammy or... Uh, Jesse, uh, for directions to that, and that, that'll be for the evening service, um, September 11th. And then um, Wade wanted me to mention, if you're part of Faith Bible Institute, that this Thursday, uh, they're not going to be doing uh, Faith Bible Institute here at the church, so they'll be having that. Um, you can watch a class um, online. And that's it for announcements here this evening. If you brought your offering, we have the offering box at the back of the church, or you can give right through our website. Let's pray for the offering. Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. Thank you, God, for your goodness to us. We pray, God, that you would be with the offering that's taken up here tonight. God, we pray, Lord, that you would have your hand over it, Lord, and that you would bless and multiply it. God, we pray, Lord, that you would be with the preaching of your word. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just have your hand over us here tonight. I pray that you would meet every need, and God, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. song pick our first song tonight will be ancient of days and we'll sing the the uh all the verses on this one sam was very she held a gun to my head and told us we had to sing all three so we're going to sing all three all the other ones will sing the first and the last on those yeah she had a gun but she
All right, our next song, 10,000 Reasons. We'll sing the first verse and the last verse. song number 275 number 275 it is well with my soul and we'll sing the first and the fourth verse no, unless you want to sing all. another you verse you have to sing the third verse so are we doing first <laughs> then we'll do first third and fourth i, I agree you know you gotta get in my sin <laughs>
next song, number 423, number 423, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. this time.
going to come up here and preach in just a second, but since it's um, since we had junior camp, by the way, I love that song, and um, you know, I don't need um, big bolts of lightning coming down to prove to me that there's God. I was, I was praying about asking Justin if he would do that song tonight, and um, and I, we haven't done that song in a long time. And I said, uh, I said, boy, I haven't heard that song in a long time. I'd love to hear it tonight. I said, nah, I don't want to interfere with whatever they got going on. And it was a song that they were doing. And I think we have two songs with that same name, don't we? Isn't there two that have the same title? I said, surely it's got to be the other one. But uh, anyway, that's a great song. Um, she's going to come up and preach in a second, but we had junior camp, so we're going to uh, take some testimonies. But we're not going to take necessarily, I'm going to ask Justin to come back up here. I know you just got comfortable there and kind of orchestrate this a little bit, but get about five people, whether they be counselors or kids, anybody wants to do it, don't force anybody to do it, but anybody wants to get a testimony from camp. Sherry's got to go, though. She doesn't have a choice. She's got to go. Okay? Anybody else, they get a choice. So, okay. And then anybody else wants to give a testimony. You want them to just do it regular? Right? No, yeah, you can, you can come up or come you can here. do it to your seat. All right, if you went to junior camp and you want to give your testimony... Come on up here. I highly advise and encourage the teenagers to give their testimony. They do it at teen camp. So um, we had junior camp this past week. I'll give my testimony first, and I'll allow you guys to just start forming a line. Um, <clears throat> I praise the Lord for the opportunity to go. Um, I was a lot less involved in this camp than I usually am in teen camp, um, but it was a huge blessing in my heart to see the teenagers kind of stepping up and stepping into uh, a role of responsibility and uh, taking these young kids underneath their wing, being a blessing to them, being a friend to them, taking care of them, watching them. Um, I had Johnny in my room, and then we had Jimmy Clark, who's an adult. Um, he was in our room as well. And uh, I was in the back room, and I got to spend some time with Wink. I got to, you know, I was with the camp and doing all the camp things, but I was with Wink the whole time. Those of you who do not know, my son Weston, his nickname is Wink, and that's why I call him Wink. Um, I don't even recognize that I do it. And then people are like, I thought his name was Weston. Um, anyway, I got to spend time with him. And uh, really, I just praise the Lord for that time that I got to spend with him. Um, it was a huge blessing in my heart. Um, I think back over the years as when I was a kid, um, and I had a dad and I had a stepdad. And my stepdad taught me really everything about life. He taught me all the responsibilities of life. Um, he was a great stepfather who just stepped up and stepped into that role, and I cannot, I cannot thank him enough for what he did in my life, um, just being my, my stepfather. And, um, you know, we've, I had a, a dad who I had a little bit more of an intimate relationship with. Um, you know, we used to go fishing and different things like that. Um, I really thought of him like we were kind of buddies every once in a while, but I got a really small portion of time with him. And, um, you know, I've thought back on that through the years. And I remember, I remember walking around in the woods back here and asking the Lord to give me a son. And that's kind of foolish, whatever, because I had, um, you know, God, I'll take whatever God gives me. And I told him that. I said, you know, I have two daughters right now, but I really pray that you give me a son. And um, I wanted to be able to give my son a relationship with his father that I didn't really feel like I got. And I'm, and I'm not bashing anybody. I, I, love, I love my dad. I love my stepdad. I love the role that they played in my life. Cannot appreciate them enough. But I wish that the two were combined in one person. And I wish that the time that I got, I had more of it. And um, just being able to spend that time with him. You know, we were, uh, we were in the back room, and he, he slept with me in that one bed. And many a time, he was laying his head on my chest, and he was sleeping. And we had a little bit of a scare where he fell off the third um, bunk right off the top, smacked on the ground, and everybody in the room got quiet, and it got silent for a few seconds, um, but then he kind of started crying, and he was good, but I was praying, Lord, I pray that he's really okay. I pray that nothing serious is going on, because you always hear those stories, something internally happened, and you don't know, and, um, you know, I, I just praise the Lord for the opportunity that God gave me, because I still remember those moments with my dad, and with my stepdad, I remember those moments of my dad where I was laying my head on his chest. I remember the way he smelled. I remember the way that it felt. I remember hearing his, his uh, heartbeat. I, I remember those things. And, and you might think that's not a big deal, but it was a huge deal. Like just thinking back, that's my dad, you know? And um, what a powerful thing it is that God has given me the opportunity to be a father 
And uh, it's a huge responsibility, but a huge opportunity. So I praise the Lord for that, and I praise the Lord for the opportunity that he's going to have to be able to go to junior camp and all that. So you ready? Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Johnny, and this was my first year going to junior camp. I've been to two other uh, teen camps, but this was my first year going to junior camp. And um, I was a junior counselor, of course. Um, but this, this past week has really been just a blessing to me. Like, I, coming into it, I had just a lot of stress going on with different things. And this was kind of just a, a time to almost just let off a little bit. And, um, well, there was a couple things that were just a joy to me. And one of them was just kind of let, to let the kids be kids a lot of times. Because um, we're dealing with the bus ministry and uh, kids club and stuff like that. And I'm always having to, like, control the kids that I'm teaching or whatever. But at camp, it was just a time to, like, see them just let themselves go and just have fun, and it was just a, a really fun thing to just see their, their personalities and to enjoy that. Um, and also for me being a junior counselor for the first time, it, it kind of taught me um, a little bit of just, maybe just a little more how they saw me. And um, well, I, I'd never been in that position before where they were looking up to me for to depend on me, whether it was just taking them to different parts of the camp or whatever, but they were looking to me in that moment. and. Uh, well, the Lord was just kind of teaching me that um, I I am one of the more, or one one of the boys that they are looking up to, and and now I need to to step into this role, and I need to take it um, as responsible as I can, and um, it was just a, a really cool thing for them to look up to me like that because I remember remember times looking up to my counselors and thinking that they were the coolest people in the world, and and now I get to do that for these these young boys and to to be a, the right role model or the best role model I can be by God's grace. Um, but yeah, it was just an amazing time. It was a blessing and it was just a blast to, to have fun with these kids and let myself go, I'm not trying to be cool or anything like that. It was just, we're all having a good time, but yeah, I thank God for it. Hi. And and something at junior camp, some like like something in the preaching kind of touched me, and I don't know how to explain it, but but it just somehow like touched me in like two things, and I don't know how to explain it. And So Rachel um, was one of our campers, one of our four girl campers, and I saw so much in Rachel. Amazing. She she's a bit timid, if you can't tell, but she also is very um, uh, like entertaining, and she's not like reserved in a way um, personality wise, but in terms of doing things, she's a bit timid. And so I saw her do things that I never imagined her to do. And she was scared, but she did them anyway. She stepped out. She went on the um, zip line. I wouldn't even go on the zip line. <laughs> she doesn't know that. <laughs> she went on the zip line. They had to push her off, but she yeah. went. <laughs> she went in the mud pit. She totally did not want to go in the mud pit. But we're like, OK, we're all in. We're doing this. We're going to get wet. And she did it. She didn't like it, right? It wasn't, wasn't your favorite thing, right? And she hated it. But she did it. She did it. She had so much um, spirit. And um, she had a couple of moments where God was really dealing with her heart and spoke to her different things, right? Yeah. Yeah. And she kept saying all week long, what did you keep saying? Didn't you feel rock? Because yeah. it did. Did you hear her? Say it again. Junior camp rocks and it really did. She said junior camp rocks. Oh, it we does. Love junior camp it rocks. Does. That was her first year to, to yeah, go to junior it, camp and, and she really totally fun. loved it. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's right. She gained us 9,000 points. And she said, I totally can't believe I just did that. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Um, I liked going on the zip line, and today, not today. <laughs> One of the days. Go ahead, keep going. They understand. <laughs> well. <laughs> and I liked going in the mud pit, and. I also liked going in the, yeah, <laughs> I liked going in the hobby hut and I liked going in the lake <laughs> and also the swings <laughs> and I liked going in the basement. I also liked going in the game room. <laughs> She liked all the fun things. So um, I just have to say thank you for letting me be a part of this because honestly, well, I wasn't, I never went to camp as a kid, ever, not once. It's gonna make me cry now. <laughs> um, and I, I live in a youthful way. I just love to have fun. I love to laugh. I love to be silly. If you saw me there, you'd be like, oh. That's so embarrassing. Doesn't she know she's 57? <laughs> Honestly, I don't. I just, I just, I had such a wonderful time spending time with these girls and getting to know them more and just seeing the ways that God was working in their heart and challenging them. The messages were so on point with where they're at and the things that they needed to hear and challenges about friendships, about guarding your eyes, about, um, taking time and committing yourself to read your Bible and so many things. Um, I just was really touched by how the Lord was working in their hearts. And you could see it. It meant something to them. It wasn't just fun and games. It was a spiritual moment. And I was really grateful to be a part of it. So thank you. I grew up going to camp and... Um, this is actually my second year going as a junior counselor. Last year it was fun, but we only had the two girls that went. This year we had four of them, and it's just a big thing in my life just to be a role model for them and to know I'm doing the right thing because I can see it how much I mean to them and how much they mean to me. And it's just cool watching them grow up and watching the Lord really work in their hearts and in their lives. And just one of the, there were just a couple small things. Um, they were, at teen camp, I always turned towards my counselors to go up to the altar with me and pray. And um, they were turning to me. And that was just something that I think is cool. Just, I'm that for them instead of, being the one that's relying on somebody, people are relying on me. And I think that's just so cool. And then um, the kids were told to write a thank you letter to somebody at the end of camp. And Sayla actually wrote hers to me. And I was shocked when she did it. And then I opened it up. She spelled my name wrong. But <laughs> and um, it was just, it just said thank you for being my counselor. And just to know that I make a difference in their lives and that they truly look up to me is just really cool. I don't, you can do whatever you want to do. I'll just. Okay. Um, does anybody have another uh, testimony that maybe you'd like to add or something that you'd like to say, something maybe God did for you this week? Um, I think it was cool being able to have junior camp over here. I think it was cool being able to have junior camp. Um, it was my first year going, and I was kind of confused as to what was going to happen, how things were going to go. But it was, it was cool for the older kids. I think that God was really working in their hearts, not to say that he wasn't working in the younger people's hearts, but it was for the younger people almost kind of getting them in the habit of going to a camp and all this different stuff, kind of getting them comfortable. So it was, it was awesome. I praise the Lord for the opportunity. You can go ahead and give your testimony. Um, I just want to thank God for um, Pastor Fully Love and his wife. They had a little camp thing last week, and my children had a ball. 
Amen. And just to hear them remembering the stories that was told to them, that was a blessing within it. Awesome. So I just want to praise them for what they did. Yeah, praise the Lord. Awesome. It's good stuff. Over here, we got Miss Peggy. I just praise the Lord for um, his hand of protection over all the kids at camp last week. Um, it was really hard for me to send Rachel away for that long because aside from a one night sleepover, I've never had her be away from me that long. And it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And at one point during the week, I finally had texted Sharon, like, can you please have Rachel call me? Because I was missing her so much. And I wasn't hurt that she didn't call, but I know why she didn't call, because she was having so much fun. And seeing all the pictures, it just really blessed my heart to know how much fun she was having with everyone and that she was being kept safe and, you know, that she, her heart was being ministered to. I prayed for her all week for her to be brave, to do things that would normally scare her, and for God to just work on her heart, but not just her heart, but for my heart, too, because her being away made me see some things about myself and how much I truly missed her and what it's like to be her mom and how much I wanted to do things differently once she came home. So I just thank God for the opportunity that she had to go to camp this year. Amen. That's good. Yeah, that, that's true. There was another aspect to this because these were young kids, parents letting go of their kids, um, gets you into a practice as well. <laughs> that's good. Anybody else? All right, you can come up. And... All right, she's going to come. First of all, I want to make a public apology because if you look at this guy with these white shoes on and this purple jacket, we, we raised him better than that here. <laughs> And I want to especially apologize to Jessica. She was practically raised Amish, um, Jessica. And look what, we, look what we've corrupted her with him. And so now G is, uh, we're very proud of G. Uh, this is Gerald Hicks. For those of you who don't know him, we, we've known him as G. He was here, he was here when I got here, and that was 21 years ago. And so how old were you 21 years ago? How old are you now? Eight, you were eight, so uh, he's been here a long, long time. And so well, he was here longer than that because he preceded me, but he grew up here, and again he went out to West Coast, did did a great job out there, West Coast Baptist College, and uh, graduated twice, got a bachelor's degree and then a master's degree, then headed off to Connecticut, and uh, he's doing a great job up there. We're just real excited to have him back here often, and so we praise the Lord for that. Um, my message tonight is entitled Heritage, and um, just seeing everything that's going on, coming back, being able to visit, I'm thankful I'm close enough to do that. It's, um, it's overwhelming, because uh, it was just yesterday, these, these guys you see up here, we were in high school. Uh, I remember the first time I met Larry, at wherever he's at. Uh, met Larry on the Holy Spirit High School football field, and we were doing something, having some type of activity or something. And it's just, don't ever limit what God can do in your life. So often we put God in a box, and um, we, we limit his power, we limit his, his, his mercy, we limit his grace, we limit how much he can do with us. You may think you're nothing, you may think that life is just going by and Obviously, people pass you by, and there's nothing going on in your life, but don't limit the power of God and the way he's working through you, um, what he wants to do with your life. He'll blow your mind if you let him. If you let him, he'll blow your mind. So um, I'm just thankful to be here. Um, man, God is good. So turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter number 6.
Like I said, tonight we're going to uh, talking about heritage. We hear many times in messages that we, as, as Baptists, as Christians, we, ha- we come from a very rich heritage. Um, you hear the D.L. Moody's, the Jonathan Edwards. Um, you hear all these names, the Raven Hills. We hear these names. Um, we hear stories about the great revivals that they were a part of. We have a great heritage of faith, but it doesn't stop there. You think of the more recent times, Bobby Robertson's, the John R. Rice's, Lester Roloff's, and even more recent than that, Kenny Baldwin's, the Pastor Clark. Seniors. There's a couple guys up north. You might have heard of Pastor Tom Bish um, and uh, Joe Vasic. And those guys, both of those guys are amputees. Um, both have, one has no leg and one has uh, no foot. And um, faithful men of God. There's another man in uh, Rhode Island, Pastor Paul Chapman. Um, two of those men I just named, two out of the three of those men, their one wife died And the other one has been bedridden for three to four years, I believe. Faithful men of God. Still serving the Lord to this day. And that's what, I mean, that's what kind of they're known as. Um, Still serving and and living for the Lord. I wonder why that is. Because there's nothing better. There's nothing better in this life you can do besides living it for him. There's nothing, out, nothing better to turn to. There's nothing else out there. And that's a huge example to me. I, I, think about, I think about Pastor Erickson. He will never know the impact he let he lay on my life. He will never know. He will never know the mark he left on my life. And I'm sure there's many people in here who attest to that. Faithful. This is the heritage we come from. We have a rich history that's still growing, but do we understand that right now, right now actively, we are collecting and constructing a legacy? Our name may not be Lester Roloff, our our name may not be John R. Rice. Like I said, I I, I was here, thought no one paid attention to me, (laughs) no no one, uh, I didn't really know what God wanted to do with my life. I had no idea really, Um, just going through the motions. I, I took up space in a seat. And when I think about the, the many who had an impact on me, whether it was Brother Stahl, whether it was Pastor, whether it was Justin, um, whether it was Cody, um, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but just the fact of, trust me, if, if, I can, if I can be here, if God can use me in this way, trust me, he can do miracles with you. Trust you me. Um, don't let that master degree fool you. I, I am not that bright, I promise you. <laughs> but there's something about our lives that will be left behind when we're gone. So we're going to start in verse number one. going to try to make it through the whole chapter. Deuteronomy chapter six. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it. Moses is giving instruction to the children of Israel to warn them, to help them, to protect them, to remind them. Hey, the legacy that, that he and all the people who are going to die um, by, and wandering for 40 years who will never enter the promised land, the people that didn't trust God and Moses who didn't listen to God, he's warning them that, hey, if you listen now, you'll leave behind a, a better legacy than what we're leaving you. Number one, take heed. Take heed to the instructions of God. Let's go on verse number two. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life. And that thy days may be prolonged. Verse number three. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee. In the land that floweth with milk and honey, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Moses, under the leading of the Lord, explaining the most basic and simple instructions anyone could be told. Listen and obey. You can't get simpler than that. Listen and obey. Moses isn't saying anything too complicated, too complex. You got to carry these boulders across this mountain or whatever. No. Just trust and obey. And the same God that wants to always bless and protect and look after the nation of Israel, that's the same God we serve today. That's the same God we call Father today. 
how are we doing in the listening and obeying department? Trust you me, I'm talking to myself. Let, let's read verse 2 one more time. Now thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Do we have a proper view of God? A proper reverence of God? proper fear for him? Only we can answer that. Do we, do we truly care about how our lives affect him? About what grieves him about us? What grieves him in our lives? The ways we, we can affect the holy God. The times we tell him no when we know he's told us to do something. Verse 3, part of verse 3, it says that it may be well with thee. It reminds me of a verse in Psalm 119, uh, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Do we care to stay clean? Do we care about how apathetic we can be towards God? Does it bother us? I've, I've, I've gone over and over this message, and it convicts me every single time. Does it bother us? Do we believe this book? Do we live like it? The verse says in, uh, in Deuteronomy, it says, observe to do it. To do it. That's not picking and choosing. That's being all in. That's not watching what the person next to you chooses to do and basing all your decisions on them or the crowd around you. That's us making the decision to follow God and obey him fully, no matter what others do. Hath promised thee, verse 3 says. The Lord promised the nation of Israel, Canaan, the promised land, and he wanted them to have it. They had messed up before and didn't believe him. Do we believe God keeps his promises? Do you understand that God doesn't want to punish us? <laughs> See, we make life complicated. It's, it's very simple. Trust and obey. Listen to him. Hey, he knows everything. We know that here. But do we know it consistently here? Do we live like that? We have to understand our choices don't just affect us. I believe Pastor said this morning. Our lives are not about us. Our, our life's goal, God did not create us to, hey, make as much money as you can. Be as popular as you can. No, it's to bring all glory and, and all attention and all, all praise back to the one who created us. I guarantee you those spies didn't think that they and the rest of the children of Israel would be generationally rebuked for their evil report. I guarantee you didn't think their lack of faith was going to result in their wandering until they died. Mm -hmm. That it had caused for them. Our choices matter. Yeah. Verse 11, Psalm 119 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Which brings us to the next, uh, next point. All heart, number two. Um, we, as, if you play sports in here, I mean, you've heard it. Uh, when you say someone is all heart, you see them giving everything they got um, whatever sport they're playing, you say they're all heart, just effort, um, working. I want you to read verse 5. Now shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. How's our hearts tonight? See, I, I, I want us, like I said, y'all are family. Y'all are family to me. And even if I don't know you, if, you if, if he is your family, you are my family. So I, I want us all to take a, take a, a spiritual checkup, honestly. Look at who you are, because you know who you really are, and God knows even better who you are. 
It doesn't, it doesn't always feel good to, to look ourselves spiritually in the mirror. It does not. Not at all. But we ought to. We have to. After you get saved, that sanctification part is becoming more and more like him. That means he's got to remove some things. He has to take some things out. He has to change some things. He has to mold us. I'm, I'm working on this right now. The world system does not work. Don't buck God's way. Because the world's way does not work. We see that through the Bible. We see it now. We see it in our country. We see it in, in, in I mean, we have family, right? We have relatives. We have neighbors who want to live the world's way. And what does it lead to? Destruction. Every single time. Every single time. It is undefeated. And so many times we get distracted. We get distracted in our own lives because so, we get so wrapped up in us. We get so wrapped up in ourselves and our own lives and, and what we want to do. The world's way does not work. But how's our hearts? Are they tender? Are they tender and full? Or are they cold and lacking? Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Do we hide his word in our hearts? Um, I'm sure at junior camp, I'm sure they had to memorize a lot of verses. But see, when we get older, we think we don't need to do that anymore. Does not matter how old we get, we need this book. And it's not just a reading it, it's it's, we got to hide it. You know why? Because this world is evil. Because our flesh is evil. And we live in a real world where there's a real hell and with a real devil who hates us. I don't care who you are. I don't care how, how long you've been saved. You won't make it without this book. We won't make it. It's not just memorizing scripture. It's not just for kids. It's something we should always be doing. Are we meditating on what we read? Able to recall passages that we read and, and ponder daily as it, as it goes by? Or is it gone as soon as our eyes gloss over what we read? Let's look at verses 5 and 6 one more time. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. You know, God wouldn't tell us to do something that he wouldn't enable us to do, right? He wouldn't tell us to do something that we couldn't do. With all our heart, with all our mind, with all, with all our might, with all our soul. That's, what, that's all of us. That's what makes us us. Is there room? Is there room in your heart tonight for that kind of a love? I preached a message to the teens like that. What, what, what has your heart tonight? Because so many are so ready to give it to everything and anyone but God. Does he have all of you tonight? Is there room in your hearts for him to reign supreme? Or is he being crowded out? Let's read verse 7, 8, and 9. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. He talked about, Justin talked about being a father. Um, That's what I'm saying, man. I can't. (laughs) We're up here. (laughs) We have kids. (laughs) We have stories. Do you know how many stories I have about this guy? That responsibility, uh, man, I never knew you could, you could love uh, something so small so much. Um, if you haven't met my son, my son's name is Troy. He's in nursery. He's awesome. Um, changed my life. And... Uh, to think about how much he watches, how much he sees, how much he repeats. Um, it's a humbling thing. And I, I never truly understood, like, don't get me wrong, like, and those of you who know my dad, uh, my dad, he loved me very much. And uh, he was tough. My dad's watching right now. He knows, I know, he knows I love him. He knows I'm thankful for him. Um, but he was tough. And uh, I never truly understood what he went through 
dealing with me because I knew I was a lot to, to handle. And um, when I think about that, I think about how much, I, I, yeah, I thought he was tough and stuff like that, but I think about what he kept me from. Man, what he kept me from. I, so many stories I have people I went to Absagamia, I have people I went to school with who were in jail for life, um, jail for another 15 years, killed people, uh, people down in Club 3 I went to school with, drug dealers I was friends with because I was like, hey, you know what? These church people are weird. I want to hang out with them. That responsibility, man, I, I had a good dad. I had a really good dad. And I think about that kind of responsibility I have towards my son. It's just, whew. I'm so thankful that God knows what he's doing because I wouldn't be nothing without him, and I am nothing without him. Um, because that love, verse 7, 8, and 9, because that love will flow through us outwardly. Let's go back to verse 8. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. That love we have for God, if we love him the way we ought to, if we love him with all our soul, all our might, all our, all our heart. See, that kind, that, that, that will come out in our relationships. That will come out in our relationships with our spouses, with our friends, with our family. It will come out in our lives, our lifestyle, how we act in this world, how we respond to situations in this world. And this is all by keeping him in his proper place as number one. See, you got a lot of people who just say that, and that's just like a, a cliche. Yeah, God is my number one. I mean, you can see the way people's lifestyles, you see their actions, how they, how they back that up or not. All the focus and attention gets put and stays on him and no one else. Do we serve God with everything in us, with all of our being? Unfortunately, um, after graduating from Bible college, I know I have a lot of people who I went to school with who, uh, change, you could say. Um, had way too many conversations with people uh, who want this kind of convenient Christianity, you could say. it. Uh, we need a new version. Uh, we need a coffee shop. We need to say that, uh, you know, drinking is, drinking is okay as long as you don't get drunk. We need to only have one service on Sunday. See, so, you know, you, you just want church to be like Burger King. <laughs> have it whatever way you want to. See, and I've had conversations with these people where soul winning and preaching the gospel never crosses their mind. How do, how do I grow a church? Oh, I need to, I need to make it. I need, I need purple lighting. I need, um, I need to make sure I have a coffee shop when people walk in. <laughs> I want to remind you, ministry is people work. And it's not always convenient. A lot of times it's not. I want you to think about, see, this is where people get in trouble. They take the attention off of Christ and on themselves. I don't think it was convenient for Christ to die on the cross for our sins. No one wants to be out of their comfort zone. No one wants to feel vulnerable. Trust you me, I get it. A lot of time, no one wants to sacrifice their time, especially their energy, and the people, just to be, in a lot of cases, hurt, offended, Disappointed. That's far from the mind of Christ. Have you hurt him? Have you offended him? Have you disappointed him? Me too. So if we know that, let's get up and keep moving forward. You want to grow a church? Pray and go. <laughs> Pray and go. Let God give the increase. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. People are not always easy to talk to or even be around. Just telling a guy earlier, um, like a couple weeks ago, he asked me, why do you take out, why do you, why do you spend your Saturdays passing out tracks with your teens and stuff like that? Isn't that your day off? <laughs> um, and honestly, I told him about how that's what we did growing up. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of ingrained in me. The way we spend, the way we spend our time on Saturdays, we, and, and I even didn't even change on with the Bible college. We got up, we, we get, I, I gather our teens, 
We go out to the mall, we go out to different people's neighborhoods, and we pass out tracks. It, it's, it's too, it's so they understand that this is, it, it's not just because we have to, we get to do this. So it's always a reminder about what life was like before we got saved. Hey, it's an encouragement to our older church members. It's an encouragement to our church family. We have a girl, uh, I think it was two months ago, three months ago. Her name is Jody. Pray for Jody. She'll be here this week for the back to school rally. Um, she gave a guy a track in the mall. That guy came to church that next Sunday. That guy came that Sunday night. He got saved that Sunday night. He's being discipled currently. Did he get baptized yet? He just got baptized a couple weeks ago too. See, it's an encouragement to the whole youth group. See, this still works. See, giving people the gospel still works. It, it, it's, to, it's to show what it's all about. It's to show that, hey, this life is not about you. It's not about me. This life is about people. What did Jesus make his ministry all about? People. There was never a time you caught Jesus saying, oh, I don't feel like going out there. No, he, he sought people. He went after people that no one wanted to be around. He, he went after that one. And you know what? Me and you were that one at one point. So we can't get used to being saved and thinking that we deserve salvation in any sense of the word. We can't be stingy with our salvation. It's a reminder to them that when they get to be my age that this is something that this is what we do. This is what we do. Because the young man I was talking about to, he's older than me, and it's foreign to him. See, that's what we're trying to prevent. But we need everybody on board. Everybody. See, God called us all. If you call yourself a believer tonight, he called us all to go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's not just pastor's job. That's not just Justin's job. It's not just a, a, a job for us because we have a title. That title, believer, means we have the right and the, the need to go pass out tracts to people and talk to people about the gospel. If Christ said, in order to reach the world for me, you have to talk like them and act like them and be like them, or just walk by them and by osmosis, they'll get saved. That would have been the way. But he gave us the blueprint to go out and talk, talk about him. Number three, remember we are his. Verse number 10 in our text, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. The children of Israel had it made. God had blessed them so much in spite of them. In spite of their faithlessness, their lack of contentment. And Moses, Moses warns this new generation to beware, lest you end up like, like us and take the Lord for granted like they did. Let's read verse 13. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Do we fear God the way we ought to? Do we respect him enough to listen to him? You know how good it is to be a Christian? You know how blessed we are? I, I, I deal with these teenagers who use the word, I hate this word, the word fair. When they say that's not fair. Do we understand what would be fair spiritually? Um, we are a blessed people. And I don't want to ever come across like I'm minimizing anybody's problems because we all have problems. Every single one of us, we have issues. Every, all of our families have issues. Whole big mess. But every single day, every single second, every single minute, we are not in hell. We are a blessed people. So I don't know what you're going through. I really don't. God does. But I, 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 we got to get a hold of that word grace and how awesome of a word that is because we will never face what we truly deserve. Don't get accustomed or, 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 or let that relationship get stale. 
And you think about, man, I think about how selfish I am, how proud I am, how arrogant I can be. Um, you only need to turn, but 1 Corinthians 6, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Can't forget who we belong to. Can't forget what he saved us from and why he saved us. Can't forget the big picture of what we are on this earth to do. And can't forget people are watching. Lost and saved alike. Watching the, good, the godly or lack thereof decisions we make. What are we leaving behind for them to follow? Do we care about the generation behind us? I hope we do. I hope we do. Remember where our focus needs to be, lest we forget because of all the distractions we come across or allow in our lives. Um, I hear stories about uh, high schools now and what they're being taught and things like that, and it's, it's immensely different from when I was in high school. Um, I think about the way what kids are growing up being told is normal now. This next generation is in trouble if we don't do something about it. It's the church's job. It's not the White House's job to teach my son about salvation. This country is in trouble if we don't step up, if we don't do our part. Like I said, we can't minimize the power of God. Number four, no I'm almost done. Heighten our understanding. Verse 14, you shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, and it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to cast out all thine enemies from before thee, as the Lord hath spoken. Do we have the right mindset towards God? See, this is very cut and dry just to simply entrust him, but in these days, the statues, the idols were commonly worshipped. What is the idol in your life today? Most likely it's not a statue. See, most likely it's usually this thing. Most likely, oftentimes, it's a, it's a show that we know isn't good to watch and uh, we make excuses for it. Most likely, um, it's stuff, it's possessions, it's material things, it's um, maybe it's a person, I don't know. Um, Maybe it's something or someone that gets in the way and you know it of you growing closer to the Lord. Let's read verse 15 again. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. He has all the right in the world to be jealous. I, for as parents, you see your kids between these ages of 1 and 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, who don't know anything. And they think they don't need you, think that they can do whatever they, they got it all figured out, don't need help. Um, and I trust me, I know this <laughs> very well. Um, I just can't imagine what God feels like dealing with us as we can act like those kids. It is so common to know that God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent. But so often we act like he doesn't see, he doesn't hear. Um, that he, he doesn't know what we're, what we're doing, what we're hiding. God is not like us. He is not like anyone on this planet. He, he knows you better than you know you. He knows our heart. He knows our thoughts. But so often we treat God like that, like that kid who, I, I look at my son, he tries to jump from big, tall chairs. Can't do that. He thinks he can. He thinks he can. He, and he tries to, and he hurts himself. He cries. I, 
I tried to warn you. You might be 50 years old, 60 years old, but how often does God have to, hey, what are you doing? I already told you, I already told you, I'm trying to help you, I'm trying to warn you, I'm trying to protect you. So often he has to protect us from us. I don't know about you, I have an evil flesh. That wants what the flesh wants and wants nothing apart what God wants for me. We are not a perfect people, but we serve a perfect God. Let it go. <laughs> Whatever is getting in the way, let it go. It's not worth it. It's not. It's not. Whatever that distraction might be, if you don't think it's a big deal, but you know it's a big deal to God, let it go. We ought to be grateful that God loves us that much to be jealous. My life verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, my life verse is, Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. See, I, I know how many kids know that verse, how many times that's memorized by children. Um, I got saved when I was 14, and the Bible was hieroglyphics to me. And I remember that was the first, those were two first verses I ever understood out of the Bible. Like I said, I'm not very smart. I, I'm not, I don't claim to be. But those are simple verses for a simple person. Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. That's a shot at me because of how much I think I can do without God's help. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Life is tough and I'm sure we all know that. This world is tough. Imagine trying to live it without God. How much harder it, it really is. Aren't you glad that God is willing and capable to save us from ourselves? As he tells the children of Israel, he tells us plain and simple. In verse 17 and 18, Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee, and thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee. We need the proper thinking, the proper understanding of who we are and who we represent. Want success God's way? Want to leave a God-honoring testimony behind? Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Lastly, number five, obey what has been handed down. Number, verse 20, when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments? which the Lord our God hath commanded you. Then thou shalt say unto thy son, we were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt. And the Lord brought, brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore, upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence, that, that he might bring us in, to give us the land which he swore unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Moses is giving them the blueprint, reminding them of what God had done before and helping them understand what he will do in their future if they listen. To the Christian in this room, from the youngest to the oldest, Live for Jesus, it will be worth it all. It doesn't get simpler than that. If someone asks you, why do you do the things you do? Why do you go to church? Why do you pass out tracts? Why do you read your Bible? I hope it's not, well, I have to. I hope it's not, well, it's the right thing to do. That's what my friends do, or that's what you're supposed to do at church. See, when someone asks you that, what an opportunity that is for, for you to brag on God. My dad used to always say, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. It's, I, I can't imagine for those who parent with kids who, uh, who I told my dad when I was 14, I don't know I'm saved. I don't know I'm going to heaven. So my dad led me to the Lord. I can't, I can't imagine what that's like for a parent. Um, Troy is, is learning how to pray. 
um, more so because of my wife, but um, when he sees someone praying, he folds his hands. See, that still gets me right now. He's, he's about to turn two, and he's already starting to turn, turn and starting saying no and stuff like that. So I know, understand that there's going to be a time where it, it's not going to be as pleasant. But right now, uh, right now, he's still in that bubble, and uh, he's still good. Um, in the verses we read, we, we read there when their son asked them why. Why do we do this? Why, why are we here? Why, 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 why? Why the testimonies? Why the statues? Why the judgments? They answered by referencing what, when they were slaves, the way God rescued them and provided them with the promised land, how he'll guide and protect them if they trust and obey him. It goes the same for us today. Think about how he saved us. Think about what he brought us from, the lives he rescued us out of. Once slaves to sin, think about how our lives were changed. But God, aren't you glad Jesus stepped in? Aren't you glad for faithful followers of Christ who had a part in you getting saved? See, this is what we're going to do. I want you to think about the legacy of the person who had a part in leading to the Lord. I just told you a little bit that my dad led me to the Lord. Um, a lot of you don't know this, this whole thing. So um, I want you to remember that every day is a new opportunity I don't, I don't know about the, the teenagers, the old, older person in this room. If you think God is done with you or um, there's nothing more you can do. I always understand if you're here and you're not in heaven, that means God still wants to work in you. That means God still has a plan for you. That means God still wants to call you to, to new heights, new levels. And that may be the scariest thing in the world for you. It was one of the scariest things in the world for me to be so close to home and not be going home. My dad dropped me off in Connecticut when it was uh, time for me to transition after, after Bible college. And it hit me. Uh, my dad has to leave, and um, I'm not going back with him. And... Um, that was one. That was that was very scary for me. Um, it was it was very nerve wracking. Of what am I doing? <laughs> um, but I know as of right now, that's where God wants me to be, and I'm completely okay with that. And um, it was terrifying. <laughs> it was terrifying. But when you're in that place of God's will, it's the safest place you can be. We have no idea the impact we can and ultimately we have on those around us. So you being faithful to the Lord and his will, it does not only result in your life being blessed, but it results in the people around you's lives being blessed. I've said this many times before. For the teenagers in this room, you got a good leader right here. See, I watched... My friends in high school and uh, middle school live a life all about them. I watched that. I watched temporary pleasure, temporary joy. I watched that. But whenever I came here, there was always something different about uh, Justin over here. <laughs> I've said this. Uh, so we were 16, and I used to go to his house, play video games, whatever. So one day he came out running, and he was like, I want to show you something. I want to show you something. I'm thinking it's a new game, thing is, I don't know, something random. He takes me to his room and he whips out his Bible and it's John chapter 20. It says, uh, why do you think God wrote that, that uh, Peter outran John or, or whichever one it is? He said, why do you think it said that? That was like, that's so cool, right? I'm like, this is the weirdest dude I have ever <laughs> met. See, I, see that, that was something I, did, I wasn't used to of someone not caring that he loved God. That, see, that's still in my mind for a reason. That, that's still in my mind because I want to encourage young people who think it's, maybe, maybe you think it's not worth it. Maybe you think that, um, you know, live this whole Christian life thing. It, maybe you think it's not satisfying. Maybe you think it's not, it's not doing for you what the world can do for you. That's a lie. Yeah. This world has nothing it could offer you. Yeah. Johnny, I want to encourage you to keep going, man. 
God has a plan for you <laughs> and he's working in you. Don't take these things for granted. I, and that goes to all the young people here. It, like I said, don't, let, don't limit God. Don't limit what he wants to do through you. See, a couple, weeks, uh, a couple months ago, um, Pastor Aguilino had talked about uh, taking a look into your spiritual legacy of who led you to the Lord and who led that person and stuff like that. So um, I did that, and um, so follow with me. Bear with me. Mine starts way back in 1941. A preacher from Texas began a radio program. That preacher who had been called to pastor out in California and pastored a church out there for a bit over two decades, he had sermons recorded from the pulpit, put on the air for the majority of the program. He had cancer surgery in 1965. The doctors gave Dr. J. Vernon McGee six months to live. The Lord gave him 23 more years. After retiring from pastoring, Dr. J. Vernon McGee continued the radio program on any given day. You'd find him at the Pasadena office with an open Bible on his desk in front of a microphone. Dr. McGee and the board of directors planned in advance that the recorded five-year program would stay on the air after he died. Just play the tapes until the money runs out, he said. Three years later, Dr. J. Vernon McGee fell asleep in his chair and quietly passed into the presence of his Savior. And it's a good thing that that radio program kept going because after he died, there was a young man working for his dad's candy company in New Jersey, driving every day from their headquarters to different supermarkets, making deliveries, a few years married with a son, beginning his day at 3 a.m. Driving through the morning and afternoon, he would listen to this radio station. came a point where that was all he listened to. And he would hear Dr. McGee give an invitation. And one day, Phil Erickson Sr. pulled over and asked the Lord to save him. Phil Erickson then, the calling of the Lord on his life, went to Bible college. Went to Bible college in Texas moved him and his family down there, and God called him back home to New Jersey. What a wonderful transition that was because he didn't know there was, a, there was an old, uh, old fat black guy in the, <laughs> in, the, in the pew who God had been working in his heart. Born and raised in Miami, Florida, uh, went to college on a two-year scholarship for football in Pennsylvania in a pastor's home. Wanted nothing to do with God. Um, moved to New Jersey. Began working in Atlantic City. Ended up having a Christian boss who would invite him every week and um, tell him the game's on. And um, he would send me sometimes to church with my mom, and I would just come home. My, my dad would be watching the game, and that was, that was, that was a normal Sunday. And one day, uh, his boss came, and he was dressed and ready to go to church. And that pastor, <laughs> Phil Erickson Sr., led my dad to the Lord. And I remember maybe a day or two after that, my dad called me in his room and he was crying and uh, he was just telling me how much he didn't want me to go to hell. And I didn't understand really everything he was talking about, but um, I remember I got, I was like, okay, I, I, I'll do, I, I, don't, I don't like seeing you cry, so I'll, I'll do whatever I got to do. And um, I remember I got baptized and I still had no idea um, what salvation was. And for a year and a half, uh, I cried myself to sleep because I, I would ask myself, what's going to happen to me when I die? What if I don't wake up? Um, what if, what, I don't know, what if whatever happens, I don't know where I'm going. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm crying myself to sleep because I have no peace about what's going to happen to me. And May 11th, Pastor Erickson preached a message on hell. 
and I knew I needed to go forward. I knew I needed to say something, and I didn't push it off again. Um, fell asleep till I didn't fall asleep till like 3 a.m. because I was scared to fall asleep. When I woke up that next day, I said, "I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I'm done living like this." And I remember praying on my ride home from school that day, God, please keep me alive so I can rush my dad to tell him I'm not saved. And on May 12, 2008. I ran to my dad, and I said, Dad, I'm not sure where I'm going when I die. And the biggest smile on his face went to my room, took out a gospel track, and he led me to the Lord. When you think about all that, and that's just for me, Texas, almost 100 years ago, and the plan that God had to intertwine and weave all these different paths, and um, that's no accident. And see, that encourages me that God has a plan and still wants to use me. And whatever way you came to salvation, that's awesome and that's a miracle. But God worked in that. Because I look at God, why do you care about Gerald Hicks? Why do you love me so much? And the amount of ways I've hurt you and I've, I've, I've spiritually walked away and all these different things. Think about how, God good, is, how good God is to you. Um, the people he used to impact you. The people he used in your life to bring you to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's no accident. And that's because God loves you that much. And he loves you more. He loves you beyond your own imagination. What impact, what impact will you have? Think about that. What impact are you leaving behind? It matters. And it's something that we need to be conscious of. It's something that we need to consider um, as we serve the Lord. So let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you, God, for being so merciful. I thank you, Lord, for your love. I, Lord, you're, uh, I don't like saying you're good because you're beyond good. Um, you're better. We are way, way, way better than good, God. Lord, I ask you, please just help us to humble ourselves before you. Help us to die to self. Help us to fall in line, whatever areas we need to. Um, dear God, I just thank you uh, for just the ways you work in our lives. Thank you for your will. I thank you that you have a wonderful will for every single person in here, and um, you want to fulfill that will, God, but you, we need to get out of your way, and we need to just let you use us in whatever way you see fit, God. And I just... Um, as you please just help us to grow, help us grow closer to you, help us to grow in your will and grow, um, grow in your word, Lord. I love you. Thank you so much for who you are in your name. Amen. You want to come and pray. I mean, he asked the question, is there anybody in your life, or let me ask it this way, is there anybody that your life is impacting? I have to ask myself the same question. I may have had influence in his life early on, but who am I influencing today? I guarantee you, your life is influencing somebody's life. But in what way? Is it a spiritual impact that's pointing them towards Christ and the will of God? Or maybe it's pointing them away. Praise the Lord. That was a great, great message. And thank you for it, G. You did a good job. Proud of you. All right, well, let's pray. We'll be dis dismissed in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. We pray <clears throat> that you would just help us, dear God. Help us to heed uh, what we heard today from Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
God, help us to be people that are concerned about um, passing on what was given us, remembering the godly heritage that we've received. A lot of people paid a great price to give us what we have today. Our parents, uh, the people that have gone before us spiritually. Lord, I pray that you would help us, dear God, to pass that torch on to others. We only have so much time left. We could live for ourselves and enjoy our time here on this earth just by seeking pleasure, or we could seek to serve you by serving others, by reaching others with the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would just help us to see the awesome privilege, the responsibility that we have in reaching this world with the gospel, impacting souls for Christ. Not, not just leading people to Christ, but also <clears throat> influencing their lives by teaching and discipling and mentoring them along the way. I pray you'd help us to see that responsibility, that privilege that we have. God, help us to be impacting others' lives. Put somebody in our mind's eye right now that we need to be impacting for the cause of Christ. Help us to see that person and help us to do what we can do to be a blessing and to be an influence to them. We pray you bless. Give us safety as we travel home. Bless all the other stuff going on this week, preparations for the back-to-school rally, and uh, just all of it, Lord. It's just exciting to be uh, in the service of God. We pray you bless now, for it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.